This is going to be Psalm 29. Psalm 29, verse 1. A Psalm of David. It says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. So even mighty men should give unto the Lord. And it's harder for a mighty man to give God the glory because the mighty man thinks he's accomplished everything in his own strength. But imagine if the mighty men of renown from Genesis 6 gave God the glory for everything. Imagine if today's mighty men were like David's mighty men in 2 Samuel 23. A mighty, a mighty man might as well get on the Lord's side now because one day he's going to be running for the rocks when the Lord comes down at the second coming. Look at Revelation 6, 15 and 16. It says, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So the mighty men are going to be running for the rocks if they don't get on the Lord's side. Even though you're a mighty man, you might as well get on the Lord's side now. It's only because of him that he's allowing you to be a mighty man anyway. And you can't make God stronger. You can't make God weaker. He's all-powerful. However, if you allow God to work through you, then God can show his power on this earth through you. And in that sense, you give unto the Lord glory and strength. As it says there, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Just give it all to Him. Just like it says there in Psalm 29, 1. There are a lot of mighty men, but it's usually, usually, the weak who give God the glory. Even a mighty man should see himself as weak. Because all it would take for God to have you begging for mercy is for a kidney stone or a microscopic stomach bug to get in you. The men of this world aren't so mighty when you consider that they are afraid of germs that aren't, that aren't even visible to the eye. So why glory in someone like that? Why glory in a mighty man? People love mighty men. People worship and serve the creature more than the creator. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.21, Therefore let no man glory in men. It says in 1 Thessalonians 2.6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. Realize you're weak and get hooked up with the book and the Lord for strength. And then give God the glory for everything he does through you. And realize the only strength you got comes from the Lord anyway. In Psalm 29, 2, it says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. They are always talking about George Floyd and telling everyone to say his name. Better yet, you should say the name of Jesus Christ. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. It says in Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This world thinks wickedness is beautiful, but the Bible describes holiness as beautiful. This guy at work said, one time he said, man, that Caitlyn Jennifer is beautiful, or Caitlyn Jenner is beautiful. And this other guy said, you do know that's a dude, right? You do know Caitlyn Jenner is a man. And he said, I don't care, Caitlyn Jenner is beautiful. This guy thought Bruce was beautiful. He didn't care if he was a man or a woman. This world thinks that wickedness is beautiful. This world makes sin look attractive. They have the show Pretty Little Liars. How does that make sense? Pretty Little Liars? Shouldn't it be Ugly Little Liars? There is a rock band called Pretty Reckless. A satanic rock band called Pretty Reckless. Shouldn't it be Ugly Reckless? In Psalm 29, 3, it says, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. 
the Lord is upon many waters. Okay, the waters could be referring to people because it says in Revelation 17, 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. If waters is the people and you're going to give unto the Lord glory and strength, then give his voice out to the people. Just like I'm doing now, I'm sounding out the voice of the Lord. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 8, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we not, need not to speak anything. So if the waters are the peoples and the voice of the Lord is upon the waters, put out the voice of the Lord to the people, the word of God. It says in Ecclesiastes 11.1, 1, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Record your voice like I'm doing and give God the glory and strength while you do it. Give, uh, give him the glory due unto his name. Record your voice doing that. Put it out there to the people. You're putting the voice of the Lord upon the waters. So Psalm 29, 3, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. This could also be referring to the fact that the waters are controlled by the Lord. Have you ever been out in the ocean and felt the power of a small wave? God controls the big waves and the tsunamis. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. Remember, Jesus calmed the storm. Remember, Jesus walked on the water. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. This could be because the Lord's throne is on a sea of glass in Revelation 15. Under that glass is water. It says in Psalm 148, 4, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So notice that there is water, from that verse, there, it says there's water above the heavens. There is water above the first and second heaven. And the second heaven would be where the stars are. So if, so if there's water above the second heaven, then you got a body of water above what they call outer space there. Above that is a sea of glass, and sitting on that is God's throne. So if you look at it that way, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. You could look at it any of those three ways. I mean, the Word of God is not bound in that, and you know, as long as something don't contradict Scripture, He can go in all type of different directions with something. This could re also refer to the fact that the Lord's voice sounds like many waters. In Revelation 1.15, And his feet like unto fine brass as if they burn in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. People are amazed with water. They go to the beach and just stare at it. It's easy to sleep when you have a sound machine that has the sound of the ocean or a waterfall or even rain sounds. It just happens to be raining right now. That's a soothing sound. The voice of water. In Psalm 29, 3, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. It says, The God of glory thundereth. In Job 40 and verse 9, it says, Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like Him? Older people used to tell me when I was little that the sound of thunder was the devil beating his wife. Or they would say, don't worry about the thunder. That's just the angels bowling in heaven. They would say things like this to me as a kid to, I guess, make me not be afraid anymore. But thunder is good because it can put the fear of God in you. I mean, you're sitting there, and then all of a sudden, it thunders really loud. That should remind you of how powerful God is. His voice is like thunder. They make basketball teams that are named after the voice and power of God, the Oklahoma City thunder they give the teams a tough sounding name but god is much tougher than the mighty men of today these mighty athletes that people look up to i'm sure there are teams that somewhere in some sport called the tsunamis or the twisters or the hurricanes this gives the team a tough sounding name but god is the one in control of all the natural disasters he is much tougher than the mighty athletes that men admire today in psalm 29 4 it says the voice of the lord is powerful the voice of the lord is full of majesty 
So the voice of the Lord is powerful. And in Hebrews 4.12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful. Quick means alive. And it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The voice of the Lord is powerful. His voice isn't only powerful to the point it would make you get out of your seat when the thunder hits, but it's also full of majesty. It's elevated up above all the other voices. It's so great, and it inspires people to be in awe and reverent to it, even more so than the voice of a king on earth giving a speech. When a man's favorite president is giving a speech, he's all ears to that. He's ready to hear the voice. He's ready to give respect and reverence and honor to that president that he loves so much. But that's how you should approach the scriptures, the voice of the Lord in your life. Jesus was always saying, He that hath an ear, let him hear. And the voice of the Lord is full of majesty. You need to be in awe and reverence to it. You need to have an ear open to it. And the Bible is not a boring book. It's not a dull book. It's majestic. It's more valuable than anything in a museum. It's much more valuable than anything you could dig up in a cave. Some people find the, the things that they find with those um, metal detectors more valuable than the scriptures. But the scriptures are more valuable than anything. They're majestic. They're, they're, they're elevated above everything else. In Psalm 29, 5, The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. Well, that's trees. Cedars are trees. And just like when a twister comes through and takes the tree and puts it through someone's house, the voice of the Lord is powerful. It breaketh through the cedars. So sometimes he takes a tree and throws it on your power lines, and maybe then you'll get a hold of the real power. Maybe you'll have the TV turned off long enough. Maybe you'll have it turned off long enough to where you can open the Bible, where the real power is. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So the Lord breaketh the cedars, the trees. Trees are like men, even, in the Bible. The Lord destroys giants that are tall as the trees. He breaks them in pieces. He can look down on them and say, I'll, I'll, I can break you. I'll break you. He can break the giants. In Amos 2, 9, it says, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. He can break the cedars. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Even men whose height is like a cedar. In Mark 8, 24, it says, And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. That's what the man said. He sees men as trees. Men are like trees. Uh, the Lord can knock down real trees. He can knock down men wearing real tree that think they are mighty hunters before the Lord, but they're really only mighty in their own eyes. In Psalm 29, 6, it says, he maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. He makes what to skip like a calf? The cedars. Yeah, I mean, you see those weathermen in Florida when a hurricane hits and they're pretending to be pushed by the wind, you know? You know, a lot of that's pretend to make people think the wind is stronger than it actually is, to keep people watching. But if God wanted to, he could have that guy skipping and doing backflips in the wind. He can take the trees and make it look like they're just skipping and doing backflips he could suck people up in a vacuum like they're just a bunch of crumbs like it's a big vacuum cleaner coming up and sucking up all the people uh, he can make a huge tree that 1,000 men couldn't push over to just come out of the ground and skip like a calf he could make Lebanon and Syrian to skip like a young unicorn in Psalm 29 7 the voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire when the Lord comes back at the second coming, he will have a sharp sword and flaming fire. He can shoot out fire from his mouth, just like the two witnesses in Revelation 11.5. It says in 2 Samuel 22.9, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire the voice of the lord shaketh the wilderness the lord shaketh the wilderness of kadesh some people need you to grab them and shake them up they're so crazy they need you to just grab them and shake them sometimes the lord has to do that he grabs the world and shakes it that's what he's going to do at the second coming he's he's going to shake it 
just like just like you would grab one of those uh, balls with the snow in it and shake it up and make the snow fall. He can grab the world and just shake it like that. And Psalm 29, 9, The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve, and discovereth the forests, and in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. He maketh the hinds to calve. This means he, he, he causes the deers to bring forth children. The hinds, that's like deer. He causes the hinds to calve. Uh, and if he if he's the one that causes the animals to bring forth children, then obviously he's the one who causes people to bring forth children. So who are you to get in the way of a person bringing forth a child that God calls to be in their body? I mean, if you say, "Well, it's my body," no, if if uh, if you can have an abortion because it's your body, then you would be killing yourself. No, you're killing what's in you. Abortion is some dark and scary stuff. I mean, you're you're trying to mess with what God put in there or allowed to be in there. In Psalm twenty nine ten, the Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. So the Lord is on his throne in the third heaven, above that flood of great waters up there, under that sea of glass. You see? They're up above your head way up above your head, there is an actual physical place, the third heaven, inhabited by spirit beings. And the Lord is on his throne up there. His throne's on that sea of glass, and under that is a body of water. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. He's sitting upon that huge body of water. The Lord sitteth king forever. And the Lord will sit on a throne in Jerusalem during the millennium. He is king of kings and lord of lords. You can't impeach him. His reign won't run out. He can't be assassinated. Psalm twenty nine eleven. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. If you keep your mind on him, then you'll have peace. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. You see, the Lord will bless his people with peace on every side in the millennium. The Lord gave us peace with God. When we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he took my hand, he took the Father's hand, he made peace between us when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's peace with God. And every day when I choose to live for God, I choose to read the Bible, I choose to pray, I choose to live right, I can have the peace of God. The peace of God that passes all understanding. The Lord will bless his people with peace. In the millennium, we'll be in glorified bodies. We'll have peace on every side. We won't have any fear of anything. So if you know Jesus, you know peace. If you don't know Jesus, you'll have no peace. But this has been Psalm 29.